Hey everybody, we're back again today with another classic album song ranking here with my uh, partner, Sam St. John. We've been doing this several months now. This is, I believe, our 14th album that we've ranked. Uh, joined today by a couple of great friends in the BC. We've got Gary, physical format rock and roll with us. Glad Gary's back with us. And of course, Randall Nelson. Randy, great to see you too. Great guys. Check their channels out. They'll all be listed in the description below. Can't say enough about both of them. We bring them in for the uh, who because Randy, first of all, it's his favorite band and Gary we always bring him in for the hard rock stuff. So they have a lot to offer. Uh, I know when I watch their channels, I always learn quite a bit of stuff. So as well as Sam, uh, we have a great panel today. We're talking the who's next album their fifth album from the who in 1971 which was an unbelievable year for music obviously oh yeah let's show the the album if you got it there's the uh, classic i mean is there a better album cover i mean it's one of the best oh yeah <laughs> it, then the that's, no, that's classic, classic right yeah it is classic that defines the word classic right there uh like i said their fifth album in between two other stalwarts in uh, Tommy in 69, Quadrophini in 73. So they were at the, at the peak of their game. So guys, great to have you here. We're going to rank the nine songs. Today's order is Gary, Randy, Sam, and me. So uh, you guys want to talk about the album before we start or just want to jump in, whatever you want to do? You can Gary? Probably jump, jump in, talk about it. Yeah, we could talk as we go and add whatever yeah. little anecdotes okay. you want to say. Let's go with number nine. What do you have on your list, Gar? Okay. Well, for number nine, at first, I, I kind of wanted to point out, you talking about this cover. And, you know, I just love the, the fact that, you know, they started this whole thing of using their, you know, their name and their and then part of the title, you know, Who's Next? <laughs> just the fact that it's like saying okay this is the who's next album mm -hmm. and also you're saying all right who's next yeah you know you already see they all took a leak on this thing and you know it's kind of like who's next <laughs> i don't know i always i find that that's one of those album covers that is like super cool but super funny at the same mm -hmm. time it it's, is it's a very good pun but uh classic album obviously like you just said probably i mean at least in my mind their best studio album uh, as far as that goes released in that great year of 1971 where so many other great albums came out right anyway my number nine is the song love ain't for keeping uh to me i consider this the weakest track on this particular album uh i mean you know like i said it doesn't suck or anything it's just it's a short mostly acoustic song um i just it doesn't do a whole lot for me it's it's not that special but i mean you know it's not like i have to fast forward or skip over it or anything i'm just it's not one of my favorites is all i guess so i don't really have a whole lot to say about it because one of you guys might really like it and might <laughs> want to elaborate <laughs> so, i won't say too much beyond that that's fair all right randy what do you have at number nine well, first, I was going to say that um, thanks for having me on and, you know, they were going to have give me Leo Sayer, I think, an album to do, but then they knew how much I love the Who since they're my favorite. But, uh, uh, you know, I, the first album I got was Meaty Beaty, Big and Bouncy, which is a collection of their early hits. And then I got Who's Next and I was just wrote, you know, bowled over by it. Yeah. And, you know, people always would say, who's better, the Beatles or the Stones? And I was always say, hey, what about the Who? <laughs> I kind of became, like, defending the Who became, soon became my favorite group. But yeah. uh, my number nine is Love Ain't For Keeping as well. Oh. Shortest song on the album. Like you said, it's acoustic bass. So it's kind of about living in the now because uh, he asks his darling to lay down beside him, you know, because nothing's permanent. But I will say that I got this deluxe edition, too, on CD. And they have Live at the Vic. And they do that song. And Pete Townsend's guitar is a little more prominent. And it. it's a pretty good version of it. But still, I think it's the weakest song on the album. Okay. Hmm. Sam St. John. All right. Uh, yeah, for my I, my introduction into The Who, I, I remember in college, I had 
a, um, a library that had a lot of CDs that I, and I've talked about this on this channel before. A lot of the albums that we've ranked, um, Blonde on Blonde, Back in Black, Zeppelin IV, all of those albums I originally heard in college all the way through. And because I burnt them to my computer. And I remember burning the Who Greatest Hits and listening to all the songs. You know, I fell in love with the song Magic Bus. Um, and, you know, obviously I knew, I knew like the big hits and everything. And um, I was like, you know, they're, they're really a better band than I remembered. And so, like, I remember I taught myself Pinball Wizard on guitar. And then I started listening to the full albums, became invested in Tommy. I mean, I was obsessed with Tommy for so long. And then I started branching out to the fuller albums and um, I'm kind of with Randy. I mean, it, excuse me with, uh, with Gary for just straight ahead, perfect who albums. I mean, this is the one that you'd want to give somebody to start with. I don't think I would start somebody on Tommy or Quadrophenia, no. um, even though they are all the same time period. This one has the radio hits, you know, it was the, the rock opera gone wrong, you know, but I'm kind of glad it went wrong because we had this more concise album. So anyway, it's it's a it's a great album, and um, I I love the the cover, like you said, and every, every song is a winner. But for me, uh, number nine, it always has been, is the John Entwistle tune, "My Wife." Um, again, we talk about comedy on the cover with the you know they're peeing on the obelisk, and um, actually I've read somewhere where one of the members, I don't remember which one, couldn't pee, so they had to bring a water container, <laughs> put water on his spot. Um, it might have it might have been Keith because he was always dehydrated. I don't know, but um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a funny song. It's um, every member of the Who is strong in what what they do, and even Ant Whistle with his vocals. Um, those are early Who records. Ant Whistle really provided some great harmony vocals that I wish he would have kept when the Who became kind of a middle aged band. He just kind of stopped with the background singing. But I mean, it's a funny song, you know, he's kind of talking about like his wife, you know, coming down on him and he's like, you know, buy me police protection, Ooh. the black belt judo expert, just crazy lines. And um, I'd, I'd say probably the genius of the song is the fact that the horn section is essentially Ent Whistle's creation. I mean, Ent Whistle could play anything you handed him and he played it perfectly. And um, I mean, this is this is Ent Whistle all day long. And I think he re-recorded it later in his solo career. But um, yeah, it's it's always been number nine for me on this record. So, and it is number nine for me as well. My wife, at number nine. Uh, I you know I give credit where credits due. Ant Whistle playing what the bass, the piano, the horns, really uh, doing his thing. Instrumentally, it's strong. The drums by Keith Moon are phenomenal on this song. I I think uh, it's the lyrics I can live without. It's just a, a, an okay song, but. Uh, to me, it's the one that stands out. It got probably less airplay than the other, at least seven of the other songs on the album. Uh, Loving for Keeping is another one I don't hear much on the radio. There's two, but th that shouldn't make or break a song. But uh, I'm going to put this at number nine as well with Sam, my wife. So we're split. We have two Loving for Keepings and two My Wives. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it works. Right? Uh, number... <laughs> Number eight, Gary. Okay. Uh, first, I you know, I should have said what Randy said. Yeah, I also, thank you very much for inviting me to come on here with you guys. I, you guys are always welcome. I Yeah, I love being on here with you guys. Uh, you know, you guys are great friends. Uh, you know, Rich and I, we, we talk a lot. So anyway, glad to be here. Glad to talk about this album. Um, thank you for coming. Yeah. My next, is, uh, number eight, I have Going Mobile. Mm. which I like this song. Uh, you know, from here on out, I like all these songs yeah. quite a bit. So, you know, but uh, Go Mobile, of course, that's Pete Townsend singing lead uh, on that. I don't even think Roger Daltrey was in the studio oh. when they did that. Uh, I always find that interesting on some of these albums when you go back and it'll be like, because you, you, know, you got stories of the Stones, you know. Well, Keith Richards just wasn't in the studio that's for right. Moonlight Mile. So we just recorded the whole thing without him. Exactly. you know i mean so that's kind of like yeah you know, this one so that happened on yeah. some of the beatles ones too i remember when sam and i were doing the beatles there were days john wasn't in there or uh, george or whoever ringo even it, it, it it's weird how that happens and they go on as business as usual it's an interesting point i like that 
Yeah. yeah. Or the be- or the Beach Boys where everyone was gone with that's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Willie Vanilli, yeah. <laughs> Willie Vanilli. <laughs> but the song itself, uh, you know, I mean it's it's kind of funny because it's a very simple, you know, it's just talking about driving around in a mobile home. Yeah. I guess it, if you take it, you know, uh on face value there. Now, yeah. I, you know, obviously some of these songs like Sam said, you know, this was another one of these big projects, the Lifehouse project that Pete Townsend had. So some of these songs, you kind of have to put your own meaning to them because they're taken in out of a certain context, which I think you we see even more as we're going to get further down on this list. But, uh, you know, they all somehow fit into a story, I think at least eight of them did or something. But yeah. anyway, uh, yeah, simple subject matter but you know the this is the, the really the first one uh, on my list that i got to talk about keith moon because he's just it's like this has such a frantic pace going through this whole song i mean he's just basically kind of doing a drum solo throughout this whole song and it it you know it kind of has its its rocking moments really and it's it's got some quirky noises and stuff in there but uh I like it. I like it. I like Pete's vocals on it, and it's just a good, good rocking song. All right. Absolutely. Randy's up. Number eight. All right. My number eight is the comic relief, uh, my wife as well. Uh, I saw in Rolling Stone magazine had it in the top 30 Rolling uh, Who songs, and I do like it. It's my favorite uh, entwistle song of all those songs. And, you know, like he said, it, the, the guy is in, out carousing and his wife thinks he's cheating on him. So she's in a murderous rage. But I love it's 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 got that wall of sound with him playing all those instruments. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that yeah. it's different than the rest of it. Of course, it was it was the one song on here that wasn't going to be on the Lifehouse project. And supposedly, from what I understand, you know, when they you know, abandoned that, it gave him a lot of freedom to do these songs and I have to make it fit in somehow. And. But uh, it's my number eight, but I do love the song, My Wife. Well, for me, um, number eight is what um, Gary and Randy talked about last round, which is Love Ain't For Keeping. Uh, for me, it was always one of those songs, it's almost like it started in the middle of another song because um, Roger just kind of automatically comes in with, you know, the, you know, the laying on my back and the newly mown grass. I love his voice because he has to start that song very high up. And um, I mean, Randy, you might be the one to correct me, but I'm not sure how often they played this song live. Um, if ever, I can imagine it would be a, a tough one for Roger to sing just yeah. right off the cuff instead of building up to it. Um, but it's, it's just one of those one of those great, you know, daltry vocals. I mean, not a not a lot to dig into with the song. I mean, it talks about, you know. You know, you bring me tea, say the babes are sleeping, lay down beside me, love ain't for keeping. Just, um, I, I love how he interprets the lyrics for Pete. And um, I love that Pete writes for Roger. So again, great song. I, I love Roger's soaring vocals just to start it off the bat. And um, they're just seven better. Yeah, it's, it's my uh, number eight as well. So Sam and I are rolling along here. It's a short song, two, two minutes and 10 seconds. I like the vocal and I like the acoustic guitar solo as well. And it, it's more my vibe, but solid background vocals. Uh, every song can't be a classic. And uh, we got the two out of the way for me that aren't. The, the next seven are just bona fide monster songs. That's why this is a great album. And, and anybody out there that doesn't think this is as good a rock album as we've ever had, then you don't like rock music because this is this is the this is the pinnacle of rock music flat out yeah. it really is i mean zeppelin four had you know more bluesy stuff in it this is pure rock here rock music so yeah rock on the maximum r&b that's what they used to call it yeah <laughs> yeah all right now we're at number seven gary okay uh number seven and this, you know, some of these could really, as I'm looking at my list, they could switch around. Oh, yeah. And probably when I hear some of you guys talk about it, I'll go, oh, yeah. <laughs> but for my number seven, uh, I have The Song Is Over, which, I mean, I love this song. 
It's got Nicky Hopkins on piano playing on it. Does a fantastic job. I love the piano in this song. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a one of those great songs of where Roger and Pete both sing uh, parts in it, and I, I you know, I, I really dig it when they do that. Uh, like that, it's uh, it's got an epic feel to it for sure. Uh, if I had one complaint, I feel like it's slightly too long. You know, I, I feel like they could have edited this song down a little bit and maybe so it would have moved up in my list. But I mean, you know, I love it. I love the vocals and I totally agree with what Sam said about Roger interpreting Pete's lyrics. Uh, I, I don't think you can overstate that enough. The importance of Pete Townsend, the songwriter, and him having this amazing gift of Roger Daltrey singing this, these songs for him. And I, it, I think it took Pete Townsend like 40 years to really acknowledge and recognize that. Cause you know, those guys fought all yeah. the time. They were never really good friends. Pete never even really liked him most of the time, but now they're friends. He will readily say, Hey, I never would have had my career if I didn't have Roger Daltrey singing these songs for me. So that that's a good point you brought up, Sam, and I'm, I'm glad you did that. But anyway, that's my number seven song is over. I will, I will touch on something what you said there is that uh, on the album, uh, who, the, the who by numbers, uh, Roger didn't want to sing, I think a song or two because it dealt with, you know, Pete's alcoholism. He didn't mm -hmm. want people to think that, you know, he was, he was a drunk. Uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah, because okay. I think Ro Roger's only drug was, you know, the ladies backstage. He was never really, that. everybody else was addicted to something, but yeah, Roger didn't partake in the substances as much as other things. Well, then I say he uh, probably fared much better. <laughs> I mean, you I, talk, the guy is still ripped. <laughs> He's 79. Oh, yeah, years old. you talk about a guy that stays in good shape. I yeah. mean, you know, yeah. he's, yeah, fantastic. All right. Random. Right, my number seven is going mobile. Uh, like we talked about, the title song. It's all sped up. You know, Keith Moon's all sped up in this one. And like I said about you know me living in a mobile home or an RV, and I don't care about pollution. I'm an air conditioned gypsy. That's my solution. Watch the police and the tax man miss me. And I guess in the life house thing, it was like traveling was going to be you know against the rule because it put more pollution in the air and so like or you'd be a rebel if you were actually going to go travel a bit so still a great song my my, my seven through three it could interchange yeah. yeah i'm i'm with randy on number seven as well with going mobile um i i would say for me kind of like my love with the monkeys i'm almost more a fan of pete townsend than I am of the who kind of like I am with Nesmith and the monkeys. Um, Cause I, I mean, I've, I've, I love Pete Townsend. I, I have his autobiography. I've read it's probably, that's probably the autobiography I've read the most than other than um, I've been mean, more than the other books in my collection, but um, I'll just get that out of the way. So Pete Townsend stuff is always fantastic for me, but because of how strong this album is, this is, you know, as low as it is, but um um, yeah, I mean, Randy touched on it. it, it it's one of those you know, blatant thematic songs for, for Lifehouse. Um, and for me, it always, I always thought about it because uh, one of those, one of those themes that Pete had for the project was, um, you know, like this, this binding musical, you know, force <laughs> that everybody can, you know, interpret or this this one note that can hold forever and you can build everything off of it so i always thought of it kind of a, a lot aligning with that with that theme more so than the you know the mobile trailer kind of aspect of it but just one of the you know he talks about being the hippie gypsy um i love how his voice is going you know keep me moving i love how high his voice goes at the end um and pete was always self-conscious about his voice he always said he was nasally because his parents who were abusive always used to say that he you know was a terrible singer, you know, he had a big nose, you know, he won't amount to anything, blah, 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 and, you know, bully for them, but um, uh, it, it's a great song. I, I, I love, I love, like, kind of, like, the the 50s style intro with the acoustic guitar. 
Um, just just one of one of those great Pete vocals. So it's number seven, but I'm kind of talking myself out of it. But I'll I'll stop because <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll move it forward. So that's number seven. <laughs> It's also number seven for me. Wow, uh, Rich. Wow. Yeah, a thousand. Uh, you guys really said everything. When you bat fourth here, you don't have much to add. You guys are really <laughs> care But I think it's a real joyous song, you know, adventurous, obviously, in the, the mobile home. You can hear it going, you know, when I'm mobile, I'm mobile. He's just, like, enthusiastic. It's a, a, Musically, it's a jam. Great drumming. I like the beep, beep in there as well. Uh you know, he's playing the tape machine, making toast and tea. He's living the life. I can lay in bed, only the highway ahead. I mean, you can, you know, the visual there, it's, it's cool. Uh, and Randy mentioned the line I had written down, I don't care about pollution. I'm an air-conditioned gypsy. It's, it's a nice line. So yeah. going mobile at number seven for me. All right. Well, I, I'm curious at what point you and Sam are going to separate yeah. here. <laughs> we this, this, number three. <laughs> number six for me i guess i have it a little bit higher than you guys uh is my wife uh i i've just always loved this song yeah and you guys have already talked about it there's really the only the only other thing i would add is uh i'm normally not a big fan of horns in rock songs but the way this is used at the end you know it goes da, 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 she's coming yeah da, da, da. <laughs> Like Good, comes, yeah, yeah I, I love that. I, I I love that whole song, oh, man. I just I just think that's great. So that's my number six. Mm. That's a good showing. Yeah. Yeah. Number six for Randy. What do we have? All right. My number six, uh, Gary just mentioned that a little while ago, and that's the song is over. It's a gorgeous ballad. You got you know Townsend and Daltrey tag teaming on that one, which I really liked. And he mentioned Nicky Hopkins on piano. He plays on a couple other or other tunes on here. And it's like Nicky Hopkins on this and with the Rolling Stones, he played on a lot of classic yeah, songs. But uh, and you know, Keith Moon, they always talk about how almost like uncontrolled, but he was in the most control, I think, on this song. So he can, you know, be in the pocket kind of guy if he wanted to. But uh, when I also think of this ballad, I think of P the ballad Pure and Easy which was originally mm -hmm. going to be on this album. I think if that was on there instead of maybe Love Ain't For Keeping, I don't know, but one of those songs, this would no doubt be the greatest rock album ever, if it isn't already. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Yep. Uh, number six for me um, is the song Getting In Tune. Um, uh oh, we have some... Uh, some laughter from the 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 cleanup the cleanup batter here. Getting in tune. Uh, uh, okay. Well, uh, well, we'll just we'll just tag team it here. Um, oh, go ahead. Again, one of those one of those you know one of those songs that goes with the Lifehouse project. Um, I'm singing this note because it fits in well with the chords I'm playing. That kind of goes with the whole you know universal music. Uh, and when I say universal music, I don't mean the the company i'm talking about music as a <laughs> universal idea um <laughs> he says i can't just to clarify just to clarify for the nerds out there that are watching um i can't pretend there's any meaning hidden in the things i'm saying um probably the weakest part of the whole song for me is the whole you know i'm in tune and i'm gonna tune right in on you that that line's always kind of been iffy for me and I, th I think it could have been done a little bit better. Um, I mean, it, it's clever wordplay and everything and all that. And yeah, Pete and um, I guess John coming in on the background vocals with, you know, right in on you and they kind of back and forth it. Um, not much else to say about it. It's uh, actually, I'm thinking about it now. I probably should have switched that with going mobile, but I'm, I'm going to keep it as is. So <laughs> that's number six. All right, that's my number six. I like the arrangement of the song. Again, Nicky Hopkins is on here doing his thing. And I like the harmonies. It's melodic. I do like the uh, I'm going to tune right in on you part of it. It's kind of theatrical. I can see them actually doing this on the right in on you. Man. I like that whole bit. Uh, there's changes in tempo. It starts out, you know, a little slower and picks up. It becomes more of a who song as it goes on. Uh, getting in touch with the straight and narrow. I like that little line. Uh, it's overlooked, 
by the other classics on uh, this album, but I think it's an excellent song and uh, it's going to come in at six. <laughs> what do we have in score? the top? If we go nine for nine, I'll be blown away, but I, I, I don't think it's, <laughs> <Me too. laughs> it's never happened. You guys before. called each other. Never. All right. Okay. Number five for me is the song bargain. Um, obviously <laughs> you know, everybody knows that song classic yeah. song got such a fantastic vocal yeah roger on this song um you know of course he can't do the whole <laughs> i call that a bargain the best i ever had the best i ever <laughs> now he holds a microphone now yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like he's like i'm not even attempting to do that thing yeah uh i also <laughs> feel like this is uh one of keith's strong songs on here playing drums this yeah. actually to me is the last great album of keith moon playing drums and by that i'm not saying he didn't do some fantastic work after that, that because he did uh, but as far as like his studio work because he, he was so much more of energy than anything and if you the more the who went along there's songs that you hear that he's only playing like in flourishes on he's not even playing through the whole song because you know he doesn't seem to adapt that well at just keeping time uh like if if you go back and you listen to a song like join together mm -hmm. that's that's not even you know you just hear him every now and then go ding, 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 yeah. kind of stuff he's not really playing through the whole song um i think when he was good he i mean you know when he was healthy and, and playing well i mean it, it, it's hard to touch him yeah. you know he had that amazing ability but I also feel the fact that he wasn't like a, you know, kind of a classic trained drummer per se. He wasn't like a Charlie Watts kind of guy. Right. You know what I mean? He could only keep that style up for so long with the lifestyle that he led, you know? Uh, so, but here he's fantastic. He's fantastic on this album. He's got fantastic stuff over the next, you know, however many years, but he declines, but this was uh, to me his shining moment uh, as far as being a studio musician. And this one is great. The only thing that keeps Bargain a little bit lower for me than like a few of these other songs is uh, the lyrical content. Uh, I don't know. I, I guess because, you know, not to get all <laughs> heady about it. But uh, I can't, I don't go along with that kind of thinking. Uh, it, to me, it's a little bit of, I don't know, you know, the whole thing of, uh, you know, just giving yourself towards this, you know, I'm nothing without you and all this stuff. I realized, you know, it was too, you know, it's a religious song for him and everything, but um, I don't know. It just seems like, I, because it's, I can't relate to it that much. So the lyrics are what bring the song down for me just a little bit because everything beyond that, I mean, the song itself is perfect. It's a yeah. fantastic rock song and it, it kicks ass the whole way through it. Uh, I love it, but that's the only reason it's probably lower than a few other songs. So. Very good. Right. Randy. My number five is getting in tune. And like they said, there's no sense on this one. I love the tempo changes in this song. And yeah. you got, starts out with Nicky Hopkins on piano, then Entwistle comes in with a little noodling on his bass. And I just like the way it goes uh, with that, uh, with the uh, uh, Townsend. Uh, and I don't know what I was going to say here. I forgot, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> but but it's if it, it, White Townsend figured it was like a he was getting in tune with each other. Music helped you to yes. get in tune, is what he was saying. I don't know how I was trying to say that, but but uh, so it, it was, Townsend was kind of a spiritual getting in tune. Where, but 
you hear Daltrey going, I'm going to tune right in on you. That's what I loved. About, you know, you said that you didn't like it as much, but I loved it way Daltrey sang it because he sang it like it was personal, not like it was a spiritual thing. Yeah, so. I agree with that. Kind of a dichotomy there, and I, I like that. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Sam. All right, Rich. Here we go. This will be the test right here. Number five for me is the song is over. Um, go ahead. Okay. All right. Hey, it's <laughs> proof we didn't we didn't there's no collaboration. Okay. Um <laughs> This was this was actually the last song I listened to before we we logged in tonight. Um, yeah. I love the fact that it relates back to the 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 pure and easy song, which it would have made much more sense if pure and easy was on the album to counteract that song with that kind of like that reprise. Um, I, I I love that kind of in the background. You know, there once was a note pure and easy, but um. Uh, again, I love I love the the Townsend softer vocals with the kind of the piano and the kind of softer guitar, and then Keith comes in and Roger with the belt. You know, I'll sing my song to the wide open spaces. Yeah. But, um, I love how you know, I love the line: "Our love is over; it's all behind me. They're all ahead now. Can't hope to find me." Just Townsend is just a great and very underappreciated lyricist and. I mean, everybody talks about the geniuses of, you know, Brian Wilson, McCartney, Lennon, Dylan. A lot of times Townsend is excluded. Um, yeah. And it's a shame because, I mean, he, he did some great innovative stuff that nobody was doing at that time. And everybody kind of looked to him as like, oh, well, he's taking the idea of like the album as an art form, taking it to that next level of let's make everything related on the album. Um, and this is just one of those great, great songs. I, I love that it's a, that it's a, not even a duet, just like the, the dual collaboration with Daltrey and, and Townsend is just fantastic. And um, I, I actually, I like the length of it. I like the six minute plus or whatever it is. Um, actually, it could go on a little bit longer for me, but it's, um, it's number five today. Very good. My awesome. number five is Bargain. Gary talked about it. Uh I think it fits perfectly as a number two song after Bob O'Reilly opens so wonderfully. And then you got bargain coming in. It's a great backup or follow-up song. The spiritual enlightenment. I, I understand what Gary's saying there, but that's brought on by the addiction and uh, he's bargaining for another chance with somebody. Uh, I, I gladly lose me to find you to win you. I'd stand naked stoned and stabbed. I mean, he's putting himself, out there like saying how much this person means to him i'd call that a bargain the best i ever had and then it really rocks from there uh really good song i, I think at one point it may have been higher on my list but it's right in the middle now at number five uh a truly great song so yeah. that's where we're at mm. all right so my number four uh you guys have all mentioned it, and uh, it's getting in tune. I I think it's a fantastic song, and uh, I think probably I agree with everything Randy was saying about it. And like you know, like Randy and Rich, I get I also love that part, you know, because and I'm going to tune right in on you. I that's one of my favorite parts of the song, uh, actually, and because uh, that's part when i'm singing the song in my head that yeah that i'm always singing but uh yeah you guys have all done a really good job already speaking about that so i don't really have anything else intelligent to add so you know, i just i love that song <laughs> very good randy number four number four my number four is behind blue eyes uh sung by and originally the villain in lighthouse Lifehouse was going to sing us, but it's like feel sorry for the bad man. But in this song, he has a lot of venom, really, and how he's describing things. And like, but my dreams they aren't as empty as my conscience seems to be. I have hours only lonely. My love is vengeance that's never free. Mm. But I like how the most of the song is this like easy going tempo. And then you have the three part harmonies, and then just the band just kicks in and just yeah. rocks it. Keith Moon goes full bore. It's, it's like a ballad that rocks out. 
up yep. and then it yeah. goes back down. <laughs> that's a good way to put it. And I, I think that's kind of cool. And I like I like the tempo change of that. Heck yeah. Perfect. I'll, I'll keep talking about it. It's my number four. Um, I, I really like listening to the song when, when Pete Townsend does it solo acoustic. And again, like I mentioned earlier, I like Pete Townsend a lot. And um, I'm always looking for, you know, the demos and the, um, you know, the, the, the live cuts of Pete doing solo shows. And again, like Randy said, I mean, that's perfectly put. It's a ballad that rocks. I mean, you've got that, um, that minor chord where that Pete is picking, you know, the down, 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 What's interesting about Roger Daltrey's voice is that there's first few Who albums. I mean, you hear a song like, you know, The Kids Are All Right or Substitute. He's using a different voice. But then once he starts getting into like um, like songs like A Quick One and, and kind of moving into that, that middle point of their classic era, he starts singing from his chest and has like that, that, that rock voice that we all know and associate with him now. And this song is kind of a mix of both of those voices. It's kind of like that that interlude between the old voice and the new voice, because he has like that that ballad voice that goes back to songs like you know, you know substitute or the kids are all right. All right. And I, I I love you know the whole the whole breakdown and the bridge, which the bridge itself is almost like a second chorus. It, I I don't know. It's just, it's just one of those perfect songs. Um, it's still one of their most played songs. And like I said, I, I like it any way you put it, acoustic or, you know, the, the classic original. So um, Behind Blue Eyes, I'm with Randy. My number four is The Song Is Over. Just a beautiful, gorgeous ballad. I, I like uh, when Townsend and uh, Daltrey both sing on the same song. They, they uh, feed off each other. I like Pete's voice because it's more vulnerable here. And then Roger brings the oomph when it's needed. Just a beautiful, passionate tune. Nicky Hopkins, again, we got to keep mentioning him because he's always adding the spice. So just a great song and uh, number four for me. Yeah. Um, okay, so my number three is it's a gigantic one. It won't get fooled again. Ooh. I, you know, this obviously, <laughs> it's a, fantastic song it's another one of those songs that's kind of open for interpretation i guess but uh it's got the the whole the line there at the end you know meet the new boss same as the old boss and that that yeah. kind of mentality in there and it kind of shows up in the chorus too you know pick up my guitar and play just like yesterday and get on my knees and pray that we don't get fooled again you know but then at the end meet the new boss same as the old boss kind of like well damn it we did get fooled again <laughs> yeah. i mean you know i mean but uh of course it's got uh um you know you talk about the the the, the vocals which sam was touching on you know uh pete had said himself that uh Roger found his voice in Tommy uh, because, you know, he really did sing a certain way. He's got that higher voice and everything. And he just sounds, you know, once he started to really identify with these songs and really take them to heart more, it seems like he started singing from here, you know, and uh, his voice did change. It's like he all of a sudden had this more manly voice. Is more commanding voice, mm -hmm. uh, one of the greatest voices in 70s rock. And it shows in here, you know, it's got the famous scream yeah. on this song. Yeah. Uh, you know, every, everybody, it's like that's that's a big part of that song that you wait for. You know, it goes into that whole synthesized thing going on. And, and then, you, you know, when Keith Moon, everybody, you're just waiting for it. You're just waiting for Keith Moon to come in. Chicka, 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 chicka. <laughs> and they wow that's the it's bad. like <laughs> that's like one of the most amazing things to happen in the history of rock and roll of all time <laughs> you know that that 20 seconds right there i mean 
how many times, I don't know, you guys, you probably don't remember Sam, but the rest of us, it's like, you know, they used to advertise radio stations on TV. They'd have a TV commercial for your local rock station. And that was always one of the things they used, you know, tune in to QFM 96. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 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 They always they always played that part because it's amazing it's it's dramatic um yeah i'm sure you guys are going to get into it so i will i'll stop talking about it and let you guys say some stuff so. yeah. <laughs> good. that you did great i love that scream it's yeah. iconic obviously nothing else like it all right randy three yeah my number three is bargain supposedly this was townsend's favorite song on the album wow but uh, on that, he plays the acoustic guitar. He plays this classic 50s Gretsch acoustic guitar that Joe Walsh gave him. Because uh, in 70, they uh, James Gang opened up for The Who on their tour. And I guess that was kind of a thank you thing. But I love the tempo changes in this. And sometimes they extend it in concert. But uh, this is one of my favorite Daltrey vocals is on this song. And maybe a couple of couple on quadrophenia but uh I, his voice is just amazing and it's like like you said it is the bargain the spiritual discovery with god is like right. the bargain the best he's ever had depending on how you feel about that but great song my number three awesome yeah I'm, um i think the second half of this album it's sam and randy picks <laughs> yeah. being the same because it's my number three as well uh you you mentioned that it was one of your favorite Daltrey songs in terms of vocals. It's one of my Pete, one of my favorite Pete Townsend moments where that bridge of the, you know, in life, one and one don't make two, one and one yeah. make one. I'm looking for that free ride to me. I'm looking for you, which is, I, I think is a great song. I love how his voice goes, you know, that I'm looking for you. He kind of goes like that. And then they have like the, yeah, it's a little dated, the little synth, the do, 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 but it, it makes this whole, this whole album, I mean, you know, Bob O'Reilly won't get fooled again. Bargain, it's it's all over this album, and it, it fits as a theme with that whole you know that that note that's connecting everybody kind of thing to go with the the Lifehouse project that that never was, well, never was until anyway. Um, I, I I love the acoustic element of it, obviously, and um, I mean Pete Townsend again talked about his being underrated as a songwriter he's very underrated as a rhythm guitar player too he's just a oh, yeah. killer rhythm guitar player because you had ent whistle playing a lot of the leads on bass and you also had townsend playing you know probably about half the leads on the guitar but a lot of you know all, i mean every guitar noise that you hear is coming from pete townsend especially when you hear live performances i mean he's playing the 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 melody and he's hitting that that heavy strum and i've just had incredible power and i know he said at one point that in his younger days, he has enough, he had enough power in his strum that, and he, it was like his party trick. He could strum and break all six strings of a guitar, which is incredible if you're a guitar player, if I've ever strummed a guitar, that is hard to do. Um, especially the, the, the lower strings are tightly wound and it's, it's incredible. And this is just one of those, I love the, the rhythm playing in it. I love the bridge. I love, um, I love Daltrey hitting that, you know, best I ever had. It's just, you've all talked about it. So, um, yeah, I, at times it's actually my favorite on the album, but not this week. Yeah, my number three is Behind Blue Eyes, which is on, on most albums it would be number one, but for, for this one it comes in third. Uh, it starts out as a ballad and then it rocks hard and it slows down at the end. Uh, lyrically very dark. Uh, the beginning where it's sort of ballady. No one knows what it's like to be the bad man, the sad man behind blue eyes. And then the venom comes in a little bit later. Uh, if I swallow anything evil, put your fingers down my throat. If I shiver, please give me a blanket. Keep me warm. Let me wear your coat. So it's got that comforting feeling as well. Um, dark. I have to echo what Sam said. Townsend might be one of the most underrated lyricists in the history of rock, uh, just fantastic. And then the fact that Daltrey is interpreting the lyrics, it's not the same, but it's kind of the way Elton John and Bernie Taupin work. 
in a different way where Bernie's writing these great lyrics and Elton is fitting the music in or already has the music, whatever. And he, his voice just changes different inflections here and there. And it's, it's a beautiful combination. And I think it's the same here. Fantastic. So that's my number three. So, well, I'll just jump right on there because my number two is Behind Blue Eyes. Yep. Uh, that's, you know, Pete Townsend and Ray Davies are probably a couple of the greatest lyricists yes. in, in rock, really. Uh, especially how they can put, like, tell stories, but yet make them personal, you know, and I, I just think they do a fantastic job. And Behind Blue Eyes, um, you know, you said how it's about a character in Lifehouse, but I think probably all of us at some point or in different points of our lives have identified with different parts of this song. You know, you're, you're part of that character that's, you know, the bad man behind blue eyes, you know, just because of, you know, maybe how you have feelings inside. Right. Or you know, he's got that line, you know, if my fist clinches, crack it open. Mm -hmm. before I use it to lose my cool, you know? <laughs> and that was one of the things that Roger Daltrey identified with in this song. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I read so many interviews and stuff where Pete said, you know, Roger identified, he thinks that song's about him. He goes, it's not. <laughs> he goes, but, you know, he, he takes it that way. He takes something out of that song. That's why he's singing it that way. And he, and he did it with other whose songs you know he and pete himself has said that he's you know he said you know what i've come to the the realization of people might misinterpret my original meaning of a song but if it means something to them that's great you know i mean how however they interpret it and you know he's got a lot of lyrics that are open for interpretation but i think that's a fantastic thing uh, a lot of times you know sometimes songs can be super direct super simple but when they leave something that's a little open for interpretation and how you can identify with it i think that's brilliant that's brilliant songwriting i think uh roger waters from pink floyd can do that oh yeah but, but uh you know pete townsend is great at, at doing that and this is a perfect example you know and you guys all talked about the song itself and uh you know the music and everything that's fantastic about it um uh, you know, this is just a perfect song. There's nothing about this song I would change. It's fantastic. And it's just got some of the best lyrics and one of the greatest vocal deliveries of all time behind Blue Eyes. Yeah. Very good. I couldn't agree more. Randy. Well, uh, my number two is Won't Get Fooled Again. You know, an epic anthem. Of course, if you watch CSI Miami, you hear it every week. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I guess that guy loved The Who because all of the CSIs got a Who song on there. So <laughs> I didn't really watch the CSI, so I didn't have to get, no, I don't watch get it. tired of it. So anyway, but, you know, when I, when I think of the this song, I think of how much of an epic it is. And I think of the, the group and I think of, here you got Roger Daltrey swinging that microphone around and singing and you got, uh, Townsend jumping up and down playing the guitar and you got well Entwist will just stand there by himself but he's just an amazing <laughs> bass player and then you got Keith Moon just rocking away at the drums I go there's not many bands that have that many great people all together yeah. Yeah. you know in the band but uh, and like he's like you already said about the we won't get fooled again, but we usually do. And with the last line, meet the new boss, the same as the old boss. But you think is revolution pointless, but I guess you could look at it more as a prayer. I don't, you know, I don't know. But, uh, and I will say it's got the second best uh, scream in rock. But if you wait a little longer, then there's the best scream in rock. Because <laughs> <laughs> it does it twice on there. But. That's right. And the I, second thought, one's I thought you were going to make a, uh, I thought you were going to make a Yoko Ono joke. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. That would be a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Okie dokie. Yeah. And yeah, but the thing with the Who is 
you always have these lists of the the greatest at you know whatever of all time. I don't think many people would argue that if you said you know, Keith Moon's the greatest drummer of all time, John Entwistle's the greatest bassist of all time, Roger Daltrey's the greatest vocalist, and Pete Townsend is the greatest guitarist or the greatest rhythm guitarist. People, I mean, some, I mean, people are going to disagree, but like, if you were just to say those four things, people would be like, yeah, I could see that at least the majority. And it just shows that they're all really, really, if not the greatest in their craft, they're in the top five of just like yeah. classic era of rock. I mean, people that worship Daltrey with his voice and, and whistle with his fingers and I mean, Keith Moon for all that he had, it, just incredible players, all of them. Um, Number two for me is going to be Teenage Wasteland, also known as Baba O'Reilly. Um, one of those songs, I remember specifically listening to it uh, the night before I turned 20 years old because I said, I need to listen to that song before I and leave my teens, go into my 20s. And I remember specifically, I put, I put the, the album in, in my kitchen um, at my parents' house. And I, I sat there at the kitchen table and listened to it and just like I didn't like I, I, did, I wasn't mourning lo losing my teens, but I, I was also, you know, not looking forward to the next decade. I mean, you just you, you feel like once you get out of the teens that you're truly into adulthood. Um, and that's kind of how I felt. I mean, I, I remember specifically, though, like really getting into it, you know, the the bridge with, you know, Pete Townsend singing Teenage Wasteland with that high vocal, almost straining his voice. Um, and like Randy said, you can you can picture Daltrey with the with the microphone, you know, lassoing it over his head, and um, you know, hitting somebody in the nose, a la uh, David, Lee, David Lee Roth, uh, New Year's Eve about ten years ago, um, on Jimmy Kimmel. But um, yeah, it, it, I mean, it's it's just one of those great anthems, and I'm sure the Who didn't think that they'd be singing that at almost eighty years old, <laughs> singing about teenage wasteland and. I mean, just that that whole that that bitter line of you know they're all wasted, and then the bump, oh. bump, bump, and then the do 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 do, just that killer violin track to, to close oh out the, close out the show. It's just incredible. I mean, just going to town on that thing. It's it's just it's a perfect song. I mean, the the fact that this album started and ended with two of the absolute greatest songs of all time is a statement to this album everything else in the middle could have been crap and those two songs alone would have put this album at least in the top 100 albums of all time oh yeah yeah so yeah um so that's my number two bob o'reilly but you know i can flip a coin yeah I, I agree with a lot of what you said the, the opening and close i mean arguably the best opener and closer on the same album <laughs> like and but you mentioned each individual guy arguably in the conversation that's the best mm -hmm. of what he does uh, you could put Zeppelin in there too, because Plant is a great frontman and vocalist. Yeah. Daltrey the same, and then you got the main guitarist or songwriter or arranger in Page Townsend, a wash maybe, and then you got the great uh, what are they call Swiss Swiss Army Knife and John Paul Jones and Ant Whistle. Yeah. They can do anything, and then you got the bombastic drummer who yeah. neither one neither one of them Bonham or. Uh, Moon made it out of the 70s. They've been dead for decades. So they yeah. lived that life in the fast lane. They paid the price. But I like uh, all the points you guys made. My number two is Won't Get Fooled Again, the uh, anti-establishment epic song of rebellion and revolution. Perfect rock anthem. The Scream, you guys all mentioned The Scream. Oh, my God. Uh, I love Moon's drumming on here. He's just banging away and uh, there's not much to add. The, I, I just want to add it one more time because it's such an impactful line. Meet the old boss, same as the <laughs> meet the new boss, same as the old boss. I mean, that's a classic. And yeah. uh, the scream though separates it from pretty much everything except the number one song on the cell, in my opinion. So we'll get to that. Uh, okay, Gary, what's number one? <laughs> All right, number one. Everybody's talked about it, I think. No, not everybody. Bob O'Reilly. Uh, just you know you guys talked about it there quite a bit sam you went on about it and uh, i agree with everything you said it's it's a perfect song also for keith moon because it's just got all that open space 
And that's when Keith Moon is at his best. You give him some open space and he can just kind of, you know, that's how, he, you know, he flourishes at that, uh, you know, and he flourishes at, if anybody out there doesn't have Who Live at Leeds, you definitely need to go get that. One of the greatest live albums of all time, but I, now I'm, I'm jumping around. But, uh, Bob O'Reilly, you know, it just builds. And another one of these things where it's just everything about it is perfect, you know, from the soft beginning to the way it builds to uh, Dave Arbus doing that violin solo at the end. That's fantastic. And it just keeps building, you know, down, 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 you know, kind of thing. And, you know, when they do it, when they do it live, Roger Daltrey does a harmonica. Solo. Yeah. Yeah. And that's killer the way he does that. I, I mean, I, I love that too, but that, you know, that's another one. Now that song obviously fits into the whole life house project somehow because you know, when he's got the line there, Sally, take my hand, we'll travel south cross land. I mean, obviously that fits in with something because otherwise you're going, well, who the hell is Sally? Right. You know, what, what's that guy? You know, that that comes from something. But I, I think my favorite line on that is uh, I don't need to fight to prove I'm right. Mm -hmm. And I don't need to be forgiven. That's powerful. Those are powerful lines right there. You know, I mean. If you if you think about that, what you know, those those are all statements. Those are all statement lines. And I, you know, man, I just think that is every time I play that song when I sing and I always sing that part there. I just think that's great. And Roger delivers it perfectly. And yes, uh Sam Pete Townsend is one of the greatest rhythm guitar players of all time. And you know what? I mean, when he plays live. You know, especially in those early days, and he's got the volume cranked up. He can do some pretty good leads too. I mean, they did it more like they did like a, a cohesive kind of jam, as opposed to like just the band laying back and letting him, you know, do a bunch of boring solos. They just, you know, made this big noise, this big wall of sound. But uh, but this song is is perfect. I love it. Bob O'Reilly just man just, just can't beat it. That's why it's my number one. Yep. Randy, what do you think? I don't know. The, Gary told said a lot of the things I was going <laughs> to talk about. But it's my number one, too. Baba O'Reilly. I didn't know that. I always knew that Baba was the, for Baba Mayer. I mean, Mayor Baba, his guru. But I didn't know the Riley part. It was Terry Riley, this avant-garde composer. And that the O was kind of like, a Irish thing for the electric fiddling section that mm -hmm. you mentioned. I love that part too. But and one of the cool parts is this and won't get fooled again is the synthesizer at the beginning. I mean, he was one of the early people to be messing with that. Yeah. And not only does it, you know, it has that what's what's fun is to watch these uh, reaction channels, which I don't do very much, but once in a while I'll watch them if they have a song that I that I really like. And you and you wonder. When this song and won't get fooled again it's got that long introduction and people that are used to you know things happening fast mm -hmm. or you can see them getting a little edgy <laughs> waiting for the Sustan to really start start going but I, but I love that part the loopy the looping synthesizer and it and it's underneath the whole song though but with, yeah. which is really cool but uh and I guess it's the perfect opening track and won't get fooled again is the perfect ending track, which is it's my favorite. On the, although last week you probably picked did my second favorite, which is you know uh, Thunder Road and ending with Jungle Land. Is I agree. My second favorite. They're hard to beat too. Yeah. Yeah. Bob O'Reilly, just classic. Yeah. yeah no, number one for I'm actually I'm surprised that you all picked the same number one. I mean I knew it was going to be one of the two. Um, but I mean, won't won't get full again. Is my number one, obviously. Um, just one of those great. I mean, y'all all talked about it. Um, one of the things that I always found fascinating about it was how similar the drumming was during that break to the end by the Beatles. That whole you know, doom, 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 yeah. Um, and you can see like there are videos that people put up, you know, comparing 
like that feel with the end and you know vice versa but I, I just always thought that was neat because this this album was you know uh, two years after Abbey Road but um yeah I mean what what else can you say yeah, I, I love I've always loved the line about the beards growing longer overnight just talking about you know it's the same old thing um just it's the same people just getting older and they're they're still the ones in charge and it like y'all all said it builds up to that that ending you know two bars of meet the new boss same as the old boss it, it, it's just you think the song's over and then there's that little line and you're like is that is there gonna be another verse but that's it that's all they wanted to add and um this is one of those songs though that when when i see the who do it live i've never seen the who live in person but i mean i've watched plenty of videos and you know all that good stuff this is one of those moments where I wonder if Roger is still hitting that scream or, no. or if it's a, uh, if it's a, uh, what's it called? Uh, like a, a, a track, a, a backtrack right there. Yeah, it is. I mean, it, it sound. I mean, th th that scream, the way it, the way it's played now. And I think the, the, the same thing with uh free fall and Tom Petty did that too during that, during free fall in his later years. Um, so that, that's a little disappointing that they haven't adjusted it, but I, I know that the who are on tour now and they're kind of doing an acoustic segment and they're doing this more acoustic bass and he's removed the scream. And they said that it was to, to keep his voice intact because I'm sure he's screaming with the track, but you know, it's just blown out of the water by the volume. But anyway, that's beside the point. The, the studio version is just unbelievable. Uh, again, I'm, I said, if you had this song of Baba O'Reilly, the album would still be a classic, even if the rest was filler um just the great one-two punch of an opening and a closing track and i mean it's it's the perfect who song in my opinion so won't get pulled again very good my number one is bob o'reilly i think this is how you start an album i mean it's a killer opening track yeah and won't get fooled again it's how you close an album but i mean everything in between is good too so it's just one of them things where everything came together a perfect album uh one of the great anthems i love the opening to that synthesizer Beautiful, the violin solo at the end. And, and even though Daltrey's singing the majority of the lyrics here, Townsend adds uh, that don't cry, don't raise your eye, it's only teenage wasteland, which is a, a nice little uh, addition. That When they sing together in the same song, those are some of their best songs. Of course, it's inspired by the crowds at Woodstock when they played and they looked out and they saw everybody on acid or pot or whatever they were doing. And that was the inspiration uh so two years later to put this out on an album and the rest is history so it was unbelievable and i should I, I should mention well, um that when we're talking about those synth parts on bob o'reilly and won't get fooled again and that it sounds like a loop but it's actually i mean pete has talked about and they did a classic album episode of um who's next and pete talks about that he he played every note of that synth at the beginning wow. like that's not one button and it's looping itself he played the whole thing um and then they took that as a backing track because the who was one of the first bands to use a backing um instrumental track and they use that synth which they still use today it's the original synth um from the album and it was again played by pete during the session so i thought that's kind of a neat little thing that people probably overlook when listening to it yeah, yeah you know it's funny you mentioning that because i saw a who tribute band uh years back and I was talking to them afterwards and, you know, of course they had the loop, the backing track mm -hmm. that they had to play along with on those couple songs there. And I'm like, man, is that hard to do? I was asking the guy that was the, the Pete Townsend guy. And uh, he said, no, he said, actually, it, it makes it easy. He said to keep time with it. You oh, know, yeah. kinda, it keeps you in check. You kind of follow along with it. And I'm like, wow, I would not think that. I would think, you know, if you had that, and if you got out of out of sequence with it, it would kind of mess everything up. But he said no, it's actually made it better. So hmm. nice. All right. Now we like to uh, give the album our, our rankings, what we do on the series. So it's a one to ten, ten being, you know, masterpiece, one being horrible, and five in the middle. Gary, what do you have for this album? Uh, I will give it a nine point five. Wow. Very nice. Randy? I'm going to give it a 10 because it's in my top five albums of all time. So, yeah, you have to. <laughs> Sam? 
I'm going to uh, echo Gary as well, nine and a half. It would, it would probably be a little bit higher, but my wife brings it down for me. No, no pun intended or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even married. And, uh, that's a good joke. You might never get there if you keep up the, those yeah. last quarters. Yeah, I'll, I'll lay off the joke. You, you can censor that out in editing. No problem. <laughs> Glad to do it. My, I'm giving it a 10, too, because, again, like Randy said, it's probably in my top five albums of all time. So uh, I'll overlook my wife. Is she listening? No. Anyway, good. Uh, <laughs> and the hits just keep on coming. Anyway, uh, we're going to wrap it up from here. I want to thank our guest, Sam St. John, as usual. Great job, Sam. Gary, Physical Format, Rock and Roll, Randall Nelson. Check all these guys' channels out. Sam's in a push for 500. Let's get him there soon because he deserves it. The other guys, too, they're phenomenal members of the VC and always a pleasure to get together with. Well, we hope to do more work with them in the future. So for uh, Randy and Gary and Sam, this is Rich. Thank you for tuning in. Leave some comments, and we will see you next time. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.